Okay, so we are in the middle of uh, setting up a Olinghaus, now we know magnitude uh, 6.5 earthquake scenario. Uh, and we're going to put the, there's the, uh, the center of the, uh, of the fault plane, or the fault trace. And we're going to rupture it uh, uh, from a hypocenter up here on the northeast corner and, uh, and rupture it towards Reno, um, really towards uh, south Reno. Here's that new uh, industrial park where, uh, where Tesla and uh, uh, Walmart uh, uh, and many other companies have, uh, have built uh, enormous new facilities, which you can, you can see some of the buildings very plainly here, maybe not in the video, but uh, in Google Earth. You know, these buildings are um, on the order of uh, half a kilometer wide. Um, so uh, that's the scale of... <coughs> You know, modern industrial development. You can see uh, in Sparks, South Sparks, there's a 600 meter long uh, Kmart distribution center uh, right there. So uh, that's part of the uh, um, part of the infrastructure that we have in in uh, northern Nevada. So we're uh, we just finished up the uh, setting up the uh, the source pane, which uh, if you look at the uh, <coughs> The, ver the eight different edits that you need to make, um, and sources is the third. Um, the, uh, uh, so these are eight different um, uh, parameter line types. And of course, this is the source line type. While you can only have one grid line type, uh, you can have more than one source line type. So if we wanted to uh, model a double earthquake rupture, maybe we wanted to Let's say we wanted to do um, uh, a, um, a uh, you know, here we have the line, which uh, <coughs> describes our uh, uh, southeast directed uh, rupture uh, toward Reno. We could add a same source. Uh, 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 we could add the same fault um, also rupturing towards the northeast. Uh, I mean, that's not very physically uh, plausible in, in earthquake physics, but uh, Maybe that would be a way of, of modeling both scenarios at once. So I just uh, you know I set the parameters I want, which uh, here for this stupid example it would be kind of this, it, they would be the same parameters except the hypocenter strike distance would be minus seven point two. So looking along the strike length towards the northeast, you reach back seven point two kilometers, almost uh, you know within 0.3 kilometers of the of the end of the fault, and that's where the hypocenter is going to be. And of course that's going to rupture the fault the planar uh, fault uh, towards the uh, towards the northeast, and so we set that parameter, and we just say add source, and we can and we get a second source line, and uh, and then I say oh well you know that one is really not very physically reasonable, um, so um, uh, I'm going to delete it after all, so I just delete it. So there are for the lines that are uh, uh, the source or the the parameter line types that uh, do allow more than one, uh, you know, platform. There's one line. Grid. <coughs> there's one line. <coughs> Let's see. Um, uh, sources it allows multiple lines. Uh, rules, which we'll see in a second. One line. Basins, multiple lines. Geotech models, one line. Uh, I'm sorry. Geotech models, multiple lines. Multiple geotech geotech models overlapping. Just like basins, that's part of the point of the MACME uh, interface. Uh, time, uh, one line. Outputs, many multiple lines. So that's how it's how we're going to set it up. Um, so you see the line in this sort of middle text box, and the bottom text box are, you know, comments and um, and and tutorial instructions. So this is saying uh, what we were looking at was. Uh, that the uh, the magnitude uh, or the the moment that we set for the whole fault, you know, that's distributed evenly across the whole fault plane, 5.5 times 10 to the 25th nine centimeters. That implies a earthquake magnitude of 6.49, uh, basically 6.5. Okay, so uh, we go to the uh, the next field. Open configuration. Yeah, I saved a config file. Yeah, it doesn't work yet. 
It's uh, sorry, that is an unimplemented uh, um, option. Yeah, yeah, that's what you have to do right now. You know, I just kept it running since yesterday. Um, so that's how I'm cheating my way through this here. Um, OK, there's one more file, actually, that we need. Um, and I have a special Nevada rules file. What is this rules file? This is what defines a lot of the, um, uh, the velocity models. It defines um, you know, the relationship between uh, p and s velocity. It defi defines the relationship between, um, um, between uh, density and, and p velocity, say. Um, it defines uh, how, um, you know, in the absence of other information, um, density and th thus the velocities increase within um, um, within a, uh, a, a sedimentary uh, a basin. How they increase within a um, uh, outside a sedimentary basin. What is the default velocity model used for bedrock? Um, all those things uh, are defined in the rules file, which has to be a Java, a piece of Java code, because there's a bunch of, of subroutines basically that uh, uh, that we use to define this. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's play with the one here, because um, there are some things that we can set, and I think those are the the uh, uh, the uh, important ones. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, how to define Q um, based on, uh, 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 you know, seismic attenuation uh, uh, based on uh, shear velocity or p velocity. Uh, all those things are are in the rules file, <clears throat> and it's actually adding to the, uh, um, you know, the thing that that MACME actually does. Is it generates the uh, the grid files, the three D grid files that hold the different rock properties, uh, p velocity, s velocity, uh, density, and then also um, um, uh, let's see. I thought we were implementing attenuation. I better go back to the the grid line. Okay. Yeah, we're implementing. Oh, okay. That'll get that'll get added. All right. Um, there's the uh, the central frequency of attenuation. Um, there's the um, um, there's the uh, um, the uh, s attenuation. There's the p attenuation. Qp, qs, um, qf is a central frequency of attenuation because of the way at least E3D. Um, uh, models attenuation. It's not an exact uh, solution. It's an approximation. So there's several things uh, uh, that uh, uh, we can set here. Um, for instance, uh, what is our geotechnical layer thickness? And here it's set to 30 meters. Um, where we don't have any other information, what is our default velocity in rock? And um, here it's set to 660 uh, uh, meters per second. Um, let's set it uh, uh, to 0.76 uh, kilometers per second. Okay, a little bit faster, um, and that will apply even uh, um, if it's uh, geological rock, um, you know, like uh, tertiary volcanic rock. So at the surface, it has a faster velocity than. Uh, than at, uh, uh, at at depth, you know, relative to uh, other things when we're using that that Saltus and Jockins uh, geological uh, model for basins. Uh, the default soil velocity, uh, 250 meters per second, is too low. In Nevada uh, and elsewhere in the Great Basin, a good a better default uh, soil velocity is uh, 500 meters a second. So there that is. Um, and uh, do we want to consider basins that are thinner than 10 meters? No, we certainly do not. Um, not, uh, not for this scale of calculation. Um, what is the minimum velocity we will allow anywhere on the grid? 
Now, the uh, geotechnical velocities can be pretty low. They can certainly get down under. In, in this area, there are a few uh, geotechnical velocities that are less than uh, 0.36 kilometers per second. Um, but those get averaged over the um, um, over the width of our of our of our computational cells, our finite difference uh, sampling cells. So those that dH remember is 150 meters. So we're taking velocities that at 150 meters depth, you know, even in sedimentary basins are, uh, and and I showed this uh, in a paper in 2004, I think it was, uh, where I did Remy surveys across the the Reno Basin. You know, by the time you get to 150 meters depth, you're up at um, at over uh, 800 meters per second. So uh, you know, even the very low, maybe 250, gets averaged. Um, you know, you got 250 right at the surface in the upper 30 meters, and then from 30 meters to 150 meters, uh, you're uh, for uh, you know four fifths of the of the cell, you're uh, you're averaging in a much higher velocity. So uh, if we uh, if we set our minimum uh, grid velocity, our minimum grid shear velocity, <coughs> to um, uh, to 500 meters a second, 0 0.5 kilometers per second, I think we're pretty safe. Um, the soil velocities, you know, the geotechnical map will still have lower velocities, um, but uh, uh, you know, we'll we'll inspect our 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 upper um, grid map and uh, our upper zone grid map and see if uh, we might be cutting it off too uh, 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 too high. Uh, and that that minimum grid velocity, what does that affect? Well, that affects our criteria for. You know, affects calculating the wavelength for our our estimates of whether we're going to have grid dispersion or not. You know, and thus the fineness of the grid and the high and the the uh, you know how high frequency we can go. So by um, upping the uh, the minimum grid velocity from 0.36 to 0.5 uh, kilometers per second, we've uh, you know. Added at least more than fifty percent to the upper frequency limit that we can reach. So that's another reason why I'm not going to be too shy about going to uh, 0.5 hertz, even though you know a little over 0.3 hertz is what we saw first. So that that kind of consideration is all set in the uh, in the rules base. Um, also, the minimum grid BP, and what you can see here is basically the water velocity, and I think you know. In Nevada, in northern Nevada, right now, I would be very hard pressed to find a grid point, even at the surface, that was not saturated with water. You know, the Truckee Meadows, uh, the water table is not that deep. Um, it's certainly not 150 meters deep. It's um, it's probably um, it's probably 20 or 30 meters deep uh, and shallower near the river. So uh, we're quite safe. Uh, by allowing the uh, the minimum grid velocity to uh, to stay at uh, <coughs> at uh, 1.45. Now, what does that mean? That means that our VP over VS ratio is going to increase to you know near the surface where shear velocities get small. That means our our VP VS ratio is going to increase to way more than the square root of three, and that's that's normal, right? You you can have water saturated muds that have a, a shear velocity as low as say 50 meters a second, yet they uh, they still have a p velocity because they're water saturated of 1500 meters per second. So um, uh, and that's uh, uh, that's what a factor of 30 uh, a VPVS ratio. So uh, we're modeling that too. Don't be afraid of it. Um, the maximum grid velocity affects the uh, the time uh, and the time step that we'll be able to, to use. Now our model is twenty uh, kilometers deep. You know that affects our our current condition and our remember the the maximum velocity affects the current condition. We're not going to the mantle. We're going uh, into the crust. I don't think we're going to get in twenty kilometers in the standard earthquake location model for northern Nevada. We don't get even near. We don't really get above 6.5. So I'm going to put 6.5 as our maximum grid velocity. And that'll uh, 
let's see. Now here it's it's turned. Notice the the notice board here turned yellow to warn me that uh, you know with a total model depth of twenty point one kilometers, the maximum velocity may be set too low. Um, so it's warning me that uh, um, you know at twenty five kilometers, in many models you get up to uh, seven kilometers per second, and I'm thinking specifically about the uh, the Nevada Northern Nevada earthquake model, which this this um, is is the kind of the default here in this uh, in this rules file, uh, and I could produce another rules file that that has a different uh, a different model. And there's examples on that database uh, that I showed you that we downloaded the the geological and geotechnical data sets from. Uh, okay, so uh, otherwise, where we you know where we haven't clamped the minimum grid VP, we're going to um, we're going to have a, allow a VPVS ratio of the square root of three, so that's that's fine for hard rock, um, <clears throat> and the uh, center frequency of attenuation is uh, zero point five. So I'll apply all that, and uh, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, so this is the basin thickness um, uh, inputs, and this is another multi uh, multi line uh, uh, multiple basin lines are are possible. Um, and the first one, uh, since we don't go into California, we don't have to use that Jockins. Uh, um, uh, we don't have to use the uh, the geologic map in Northern California to estimate ba basin thickness from uh, bedrock proximity. We're going to use this um, uh, this Jock Saltus and Jockins uh, uh, basin map, which includes the volcanic rifts, and uh, it actually has. Uh, the Virginia Range as uh, mostly a volcanic basin. So there's kind of some unexpected things that result from this. Uh, and remember, I, I set the uh, the top depth of the uh, of the Olinghaus Fault to uh, two kilometers, um, and we'll uh, we'll double check that. Um, so uh, uh, you know that's. Uh, because uh, a, a lot of this uh, area in the Virginia Range, as you know, it's uh, got volcanics at the surface, and it actually represents a rather large and deep volcanic rift. And that uh, that volcanic filled basin, uh, you know, causes seismic basin effects almost as efficiently as, uh, and in some cases more efficiently, than uh, the alluvium filled basin, the sedimentary, um, the classic sedimentary basin. That's the Reno Basin. So uh, uh, it's very important to include that uh, um, this basin thickness and geology map, um, and it's derived from gravity. So there really is uh, you know less density in those uh, volcanic filled basins, and that certainly suggests uh, why there's uh, less uh, you know less velocity than true bedrock. Uh, you know think about think about the uh, uh, the Sierra Nevada batholith and its roof pendants in this area as our as our bedrock. So let's uh, let's get that basin file from the Oling House, and that is uh, the Jockins uh, basin depth. Okay, uh, and uh, the uh, notice board is turned green to uh, indicate uh, that um, there is actually. Uh, you know, it checked through uh, every every ten every tenth line of the file, and it found some uh, um, some points within the the area. Now, th there are more than sixty point values. Actually, this is a you know I happen to know this is a grid, um, but these uh, you know these basin um, and the geotechnical files uh, the the file format is very very simple. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me just bring it up uh, for you. Um, you know, the Jockins Basin depth that we just read. You can just open it in, in any text editor, and uh, it's it's really a completely unstructured. Uh, uh, you know, it's got this column format, but there doesn't have to be any particular order to the um, to the points. And uh, MACME assumes. That there is no order to the points. You can see here that it's ordered as a evenly spaced grid, and I happen to know the grid spacing here is uh, two kilometers. 
Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so you have just latitude, longitude, and uh, basin thickness in kilometers. That's, that's all that those basin uh, depth files need to contain. Okay, uh, And they can be in any order. And if you want to produce your own basin depth file, I mean, I could, I could say, well, there's this one value in the Jockins basin depth uh, map that I really don't like, and I want to change it. OK, you make your own version. Just edit it in a text editor. Save it and bring it in. Uh, it's meant to be incredibly easy, which means it's also easy to screw it up. But uh, um, you know that's what we have to live with. The geological file has the same thing. It has longitude, latitude, and then a number which indicates the um, uh, which indicates the uh, the type of um, of geology, and it's very. You can, it's this is an incredibly generalized uh, geologic map. See um, the Saltus and Jockins uh, uh, 1995 map. Uh, there's basically, um, and I can't remember which number is which. Sorry. There's basically water, no data. Um, uh, there's um, sedimentary basin and volcanic basin and uh, bedrock. So uh, those are the uh, and and where where uh, there's water in in this map, I assume that that's sedimentary basin. Okay, um, so that's uh, you know very much together with the uh, with the uh, uh, the assumptions of the of the Jockins uh, inversion, which is good throughout the the basin and range. Uh, we might as well bring in that too, just to just to make sure it checks out. Um, there it is, Jockins uh, geology. Okay, we get another green notice board, so it's fine. Uh, okay, now, you know, if you just have a scattering of isolated points. Oh, okay. Can you uh, can you you can download it from that data folder? It's a fairly large file. It might be. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so you know what interpolation do we want for base for the Jockins basin depth um, files? I like to use um, this distant weighted average within a, a radius. I should use a triangulated irregular network, um, but I uh, uh, the software I used uh, twenty five years ago to generate triangulated irregular networks I cannot find. So uh, got to try to resurrect that. There's these various interpolation methods. You know, we can use nearest neighbor, uh, but all these work within a uh, uh, an interpolation radius. Okay, so you know, looking for you, you've got this uh, scattering of points. You know, they're not necessarily in a grid. Um, looking for the um, um, looking for the uh, uh, the nearby points, you know, you're at some location, and let's look around uh, over. Uh, you know, I said these these this this Jockins grid is spread over is a uh, is a grid spaced at two kilometers, so we're going to look within a radius of five kilometers, and then um, you know where we come to the edges of the data set, you know, how far are we going to reach out to see if there's any points nearby, and I suggest uh, something larger, maybe uh, twenty kilometers. Um, just to um, just to uh, uh, in case we were coming approaching any of the boundaries of the of the Jockins data set, so I'm going to apply the uh, these parameters to the basin line that's already there. Hit apply parameters, so we see type equals geo depth, um, and then there's the uh, the names of the files, which means the files got to be in the folder, okay, and the, there's the interpolation type. Uh, the name of the, ge the geology file, uh, the rate, and the, the two uh, radii. So now we're gonna we're gonna um, we have as well an overlapped on top, you know, sort of painted, not very well merged, but painted on top of the Jockins uh, uh, basin depths. We want to use uh, the uh, basin thickness data from the uh, Abbott and Louis paper, 
in 2000. So we'll go and get that, and hopefully, uh, yeah, maybe I didn't get that file. No, no, Reno Abbott thickness, yeah. Okay, there it is. Get another green screen, <coughs> and um, um, now this also happens to be a grid. Uh, again, that's not required. Um, very similar file type. I happen to know that that grid is spaced at um, um, at about uh, 400 meters. Um, so we'll use a couple times that uh, for the uh, the interpolation radius, um, and uh, you know we can um, uh, there's uh, you know we could use nearest neighbor uh, for base and depth files. I, I do like to use uh, the uh, the distance weighted uh, uh, average within that radius. Uh, the regional search. I'm going to cut that back uh, to. Uh, Two kilometers as well. I don't want. Well, actually, maybe you know, maybe I, I'll merge the two data sets a little bit better if I use a wider one. So I'm going to take that to five kilometers. This uh, the the Reno uh, basin thickness data set, you know, covers the main Reno and Sparks basins, uh, and then uh, out here, yeah. So our rupture at least is is not going to cross any boundaries. Uh, between different basin uh, data sets. Okay, so then I, I want to add a second basin. And um, the more specific information, the, the, the Abbott and Louis, which is you know finer spacing, you know it's a more, uh, it's a more detailed model of the Reno basin than what Jockins has. It, it had, you know it has the same basic uh, features, but there's a lot more detail in the Reno in the um, in the Reno Basin from the, the, the Abbott model. Um, that's, um, um, that means that I want to project all my basin depths uh, first uh, you know, right across our calculation grid using the Jockins uh, basin depth. So that line, that basin line comes first. And then painted on top of that, where it, it has values, will be the Reno, uh, the the Abbott uh, Basin uh, uh, thickness data set, so it's going to you know, um, it's going to use the best information available um, for any given part, and and that's going to vary depending on where you are. You know, if you're in the Reno Basin, the best information is from the Abbott map. If you're out here in the Virginia Range, the best information is is from the Jockins uh, map. Uh, you know, if you're down here on Mount Rose, the best information is is from the Jockins map. So that's uh, one of the big jobs. Uh, one of the big things that that MACME handles is this uh, juxtaposition and overlapping of uh, different data sets. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and save this. Okay. <clears throat> um, now we'll. Um, uh, it's the same deal with the geotechnical inputs. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's get a geotechnical file, and we're going to use the Remy VS30. That includes the Reno transect, uh, and you can see here that um, there's uh, you know 162 value uh, measurement values read from. Uh, um, uh, you know, from that that data set, and th that are within this small grid. You know, we have been making a lot of measurements around Reno, and uh, all the ones that I care to have publicly available are are in there. Um, so we get a green uh, a green screen. Now um, we can we can generate a stochastic uh, geotechnical model. This is a module added by. Um, um, Added by um, um, Bill Saverin, um, one of my uh, uh, former interns. He's now uh, working with uh, Kim Olson down at uh, uh, Scripps in San Diego State. Um, so uh, uh, here, um, uh, now these are scattered points. This is not a grid. This uh, Remy VS30. It's just it contains 
everywhere we've we've made a measurement, and uh, let's just take a look at it. Um, uh, there it is. Again, it's a text file. It has longitude, latitude, and then meters per second in this case of uh, of uh, VS30, uh, and we already set the geotechnical depth to be uh, to be 30 meters. So, uh, you know, this is going to uh, become a geotechnical layer along with the defaults where there are not measurements. It's going to become a geotechnical layer. Uh, at the very top of the model, and then that's going to get averaged into the uh, the upper zone of uh, the finite difference samples. Uh, and this file is indeed uh, pretty much in random order. It's probably in the order that I uh, I actually did the uh, um, did the uh, uh, the survey. And why are all these repeated points here? That's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Um, these could be repeated measurements at the same spot, but really this file should only contain you know, one preferred uh, value at each spot, which is generally what it does have. Now all these longitudes and latitudes, you know, at a model at this scale, it starts to make a difference. You know, when the grid, the the grid uh, spacing at 150 meters is pretty similar to the difference between you know one spot has um, between its coordinates in say uh, um, um, WGS84, which is what Google Earth uses. Okay. And its coordinates in um, um, in um, uh, NAD twenty seven, um, and I'm sorry to tell you that uh, you know latitude and longitude are not latitude and longitude. You have to actually say uh, which coordinate system the your values are in, and so um, uh, all of the different Latitudes and longitudes that we've given in this have to, you know, we're not saying here in, in MACME, we're not saying which uh, which coordinate system it is um, or which uh, datum it is, but having used Google Earth for getting, uh, you know, the grid corners and the uh, um, and the uh, uh, the fault parameters, um, we need to be aware that we've essentially set. Everything to be in WGS84, uh, and the uh, the data files that we've looked at so far that so far that had latitudes and longitudes in them, those are in uh, those are in uh, WGS84 as well. However, um, if you look at uh, fault data, say directly from uh, the NBMG, if you look at uh, geological maps. Uh, the NBMG stores all of their coordinates in NAD27. And so if you're going to use their coordinates and you care about the 100 or 120 meter difference in our area between those two datums, then um, you've got to convert those coordinates from NAD27 to uh, WGS84. All right. So that's, uh, that's a warning about that. OK, for uh, geotechnical inputs, uh, here we only have one. In other places, I, I might have more than one. You know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll put down my, um, let's see. So um, let's finish this one first. Um, I'm going to make a more um, uh, sort of geological map looking uh, geotechnical map. So I'm going to try nearest neighbor. And I'm going to look out to um, a distance of five kilometers for the nearest neighbor uh, for any given geotechnical uh, uh, measurement. All right, so that'll you know that'll create a geotechnical map with a certain form. Okay, and again, here's another place to select the uh, geotechnical depth. Okay, so I'll apply those parameters. Okay, and I only have one geotech line here. Um, now in Las Vegas, typically uh, 
I'll, I'll make this same file. I have a lot of measurements in and near Las Vegas that are uh, in this file as well, the Remy vs 30ask file. And, um, and I'll put those in a very similar way. But uh, then I want to paint over with the parcel map, wherever the parcel map exists, the Clark County parcel map. Um, so uh, uh, the parcel map will become a, um, a another line, um, and uh, um, and I'll use a different uh, uh, interpolation as well because the parcel map samples are on average only uh, th um, three hundred meters apart uh, over their their six hundred square miles of uh, of applicability. OK, I'm going to save again. Just save over. Uh, OK, now we get to the time sampling. OK, so here you know, it's looking at the, we're going to evaluate the current condition. Um, so with dh uh, of uh, 0.15 kilometers and a maximum velocity rule of 6.5 kilometers, the current condition specifies that uh, dt has to be less than um, uh, 0 0.0114, uh, 11.4 milliseconds. So let's let's make it uh, 10 milliseconds. Just enter that and apply. Um, now it's the field is yellow because um, it says you know 100 seconds of calculated time. Is less than the 150 or so seconds needed for corner-to-corner -corner wave propagation at the minimum shear velocity. Okay, um, you know, which is of course very much slower. Um, we're not going to need all that uh, all that time, though, not for the Little Reno Basin. So I'm going to actually cut back the total model time to 60 uh, 60 seconds. Okay, and then apply it. So uh, uh, we have dt of uh, 0.01 second, and the number of time steps t is 6,001. Okay, which is uh, it's going to take a while, but um, not forever. You know, if you get over 10,000 time points to calculate, then you know you know you're in for a long wait. Um, uh, on bigger grids, when I was doing, I was also calculating about 6,000 time points. Of course, you know, looking at much larger grid grid spacing and and lower frequencies uh, for my um, my Furnace Creek scenarios, and uh, it was taking about uh, oh what was it uh, five seconds per uh, per um, uh, time loop, five seconds per uh, um, per time sample to uh, to do the co the computation. Uh, at least on on old cogs, um, you know. Hopefully, we can cut that to two seconds or less uh, on uh, on the newer machine. But um, and that meant that uh, it was uh, about a twelve hour run, 12, 14 hour run for six thousand uh, uh, six thousand time points. Uh, and it gives you an estimate here of uh, you know how many grid nodes there are. Uh, and the number of uh, gigaflops, and um, I don't know. I don't think I, I don't think my estimate of CPU hours is very uh, very accurate here. John, can you relate a gigaflop to a gigahertz? Um, yeah. What I, I think what I'm assuming, you know, it's a floating point operation, right? And um, most chips these days. Can do. Um, I think what I assumed here uh, was uh, was that this is a a fairly you know we're looking at a fairly fine you know a fairly small uh, machine at each node. So you know only about one gigaflop. What is that? Though? That's that's one billion floating point operations per uh, per second. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying in terms of like relating it back to. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have, we have. Um, like, how much can a gigahertz put out? Yeah. So most machines now are are um, are uh, uh, 
you know, two to three uh, gigahertz, right? And they 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 can manage, uh, on average, you know, one floating point calculation per, um, you know, which is basically a floating point multiplication. Uh, they can they can manage, uh, you know, one of those every every two or three clock cycles. Okay, so uh, so you know you take the uh, the hertz and you divide you divide by two or three. So that's what I'm what I'm assuming here. Uh, you know, Intel chips have been getting a lot better lately. Um, you know, and while while uh, we're not directly taking advantage of, of multi cores, you know, when you hear gigaflop numbers, you often it's often assumed that that you're calculating symmetrically on all the cores at once, and uh, that that doesn't happen, you know, in real calculations. <laughs> because they're they're you know, um, I mean what E three will do, what WP four will do, is it will parcel things out to different cores. It will parcel things out to different uh, uh, nodes, you know, uh, different CPUs, different nodes, uh, and and manage the uh, the memory uh, with all that. Um, but uh, you know when we're running on one CPU, effectively one machine here. Uh, in this simple setup, uh, you know, we get nowhere near the the stated gigaflop. So, you know, in my view, um, it's been about ten years since there's been a major advance in in gigaflop rates of any given chip. Um, but I, I think there's some some of the new Intel chips are are solving that problem. They're um, they're they're actually speeding up the the FPU, the floating point unit, um, and putting in. You know they're putting in actual you know parallel array computations so they can pipeline uh, many computations and kind of do them all in one clock cycle. Um, it's uh, it's it's so amazing technology, um, and it's getting better all the time. Uh, yeah, so despite that, uh, you know this gives you uh, uh, an idea of the gigaflops, and it, it's estimating, you know. How many grid nodes and, and how many time steps? Now we know. Um, I, I I think the CPU hour thing is off though. Um, well, we'll find out. We'll find out. Okay, now now we get to one of the more complicated, uh, and this is the last one. Um, it's one of the more complicated uh, uh, specifications. Uh, well, first, I'll say. Okay, no matter what, I always want an image of the maximum horizontal ground velocity. I want it to be a map at a constant depth z, and I want it to be I want that depth to be to be zero. Um, now the uh, for computational efficiency, um, it's going to uh, um, it's going to look at the uh, you know for assessing the the uh, the mac the maximum Horizontal ground velocity. It's not. It doesn't have to look at every time point. And what do we settle on? We settle on ten milliseconds. So if I put an output time interval of uh, of uh, of thirty milliseconds, it's going to check every third sample, and that's going to save us something. Um, you know, the author of Sean Larson, the author of the of the E3D code, suggests that normally we can check every four samples. Okay, so. Um, We'll uh, we'll do that, and I want a base file name. I'm going to get a an E3D image file out of this, and it's going to have a base name. Um, and so we'll uh, we'll make we'll give that some more in, um, informative uh, um, name. So it's an Olinghaus M six point five is going to be our base name, and um, uh, there's not enough here about what happens. Um, I'm gonna, uh, but I'm gonna indicate here that that's gonna come out in Intel float, just so there's no confusion. Um, and then I'll apply parameters. Now this is a multi, uh, uh, you know, multi. There are gonna be hundreds and hundreds of image uh, of uh, output lines of different types. This is a uh, one one of the uh, image output lines, 
<clears throat> so also one of the first things we, we're going to want to do is check out you know how how did our model assemble you know are we running our calculation on a reasonable model and uh, so uh, something I, I like to get uh, these are the things that that the model assembly can produce and let's let's definitely check out the map of basin thickness to see uh, if uh, we have any problems there. Um, and that's going to come out in IEEE float. In fact, I could get it in I, right now I can get an IEEE float or ASCII text as a kind of you know, arc info grid file if you wanted that. I just want to look at these quickly in view mat, so I'll get it out in IEEE uh, float. So I'll add an output line. Okay, notice that that's not an image line, that's an, that's an amplif line. Um, you know, for uh, short for amplification map, and here's the file name that's going to come out. Okay, um, and it's uh, um, it's going to say IEEE, and I've just discovered in my uh, in my uh, you know internet searches that uh, uh, IEEE uh, finally knuckled under to Intel, and uh, Intel uh, Intel floats are now called IEEE just as much as uh, as uh, uh, as what I used to call IEEE float, you know, internet ordered floats. Um, so they actually changed the standard so that that Intel is now IEEE standard. Um, what can you do? So the old IEEE is no longer used. Well, yeah, I mean, the the fact is nobody does use it, right? It, it's it's not on any machine now. Everything is Intel float. So it's kind of getting phased out. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, probably, probably. Um, you know, as you guys noticed, a lot of SegWi data you get is still in uh, old IEEE float um, in internet internet order. So, um, um, you know, at least in seismic exploration, it's going to be around for quite a while because you never get rid of data, right? Um, okay. What else do I want? I want a map of uh, geotechnical velocity. I want to check out that assembly. Um, and that's all going to be the same, so I'll just add that output. OK, we've got three lines already. Um, I want to get a, uh, a movie of snapshots in time. OK? Um, and I'm going to get uh, uh, you know, not, not a section, but a map. I want to see the waves propagate across the map of Reno. Uh, so it's going to be at depth zero. And um, uh, that's actually going to come out in Intel float. OK, so I'll uh, make that correct. Um, and uh, um, uh, now the output time interval. Um, uh, what I like, uh, uh, so we have 60 seconds of calculation we're making here. I like to have um, at least 200 frames in my wave propagation movie. So uh, 60 seconds divided by 200 is what? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's zero. Uh, right, right, right. One third. Yeah. So um, uh, um, the um, uh, I, I recently, you know, uh, when when I was doing those big ruptures uh, along the Furnace Creek fault zone, you know, there was enough going on there that I wanted four hundred frames in the movie. And I had to calculate way more than 100, than 100 seconds. Um, but 200 frames is going to be a perfectly adequate movie here. So um, OK, so my output interval is going to be 0.3. And it's going to end up being a, uh, um, uh, an even, it's got to be an even multiple of our, of our uh, dt anyway, which is 10 milliseconds. So 0.3 will be good. We'll get a few more than, than uh, 200 frames out of it. Add output. Notice that's another image line. Okay, 
these uh, these output lines they can be in any any order. It really doesn't matter. Um, all right, one more uh, output type that we could have. Did anybody look up some? Uh, um, um, did anybody look up some um, coordinates of uh, seismic stations in Reno? Um, you're right. So um, let's see. Do I have one somewhere? Uh, let's get at least let's get at least one seismogram. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes. Yeah, so somebody, has somebody, anybody got uh, Google Earth running, or Google Maps, or something you can get uh, decimal lat lawn out of? Um, let's uh, uh, let's get the LMR building. We've got a we've got a seismic sensor in there. Okay. So I'll call that station LMR, and that'll be at. Uh, 39.5 something and uh, okay and then uh, minus 119 point all right um, let's see and um, uh, Uh, hmm. It could be a tab. It can be it, any white space works. Uh, well, a new line doesn't work. Okay, so I'm going to hit a new line for another station. Um, let's see some prominent. Well, I don't know if I want to finger any particular business owner in in Reno. Yeah. So what's what's that? <laughs> okay. Negative one nineteen uh, eight two eight eight two eight four five. Okay. Are you on the river or near the river? Oh right, right, right. Oh yeah. You're in the hills. Okay, that's good. So we'll use that. Are you on uh, are you on bed are you on volcanic bedrock? Yeah, but it's it, it's actually volcanic, so uh, it yeah. It is so it'll be it'll be a basin, yeah. Yeah. Um, Where do you think the worst shaking would be? Well, so so let's check out. You know, the deepest part, point in the Reno Basin is um, is at the intersection of West McCarran and um, um, let's see, just south of the river. May Mayberry. Um, uh, no, west of there. Um, so uh, uh, let's. Um, John, I kind of got to go to set up the. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, West McCarran and uh, uh, Mayberry. Um, What's that? Uh, yeah. Okay, now I want one more point. Uh, do you think Mount Rose is on our grid? Um, slide the top of Slide Mountain. We have a station there. Uh, no, actually, I'm thinking it's not. Uh, so what should we use as a? Yeah, can you find the top of Peavine real quick? I think we even have a station up there, uh, but that's not going to be bedrock. Dang it. Um, okay, we'll go with this. Okay, those are the considerations. 
So I just, you know, I, I type in as many stations as I want, and I have to only have to put push add output once. Now you can see that there's all these uh, SAC lines added. Well, three SAC lines added. So now I better save. All right. And, uh, and we're done for now. We've gotten all the way through the MACME interface.